Hello, everyone, and welcome to our virtual feature match here at Riley Night in the booth alongside Corey Baumeister. For the first time today, Corey, welcoming our viewers to coverage today. Javier Dominguez and Jean Emmanuel Dupra are the opening act. And uh, as we've already talked about a little bit, Corey Dominguez, with everything to play for right now. Yeah, no kidding. One more win out of these next three matches, securing a spot in the top eight. Pretty big deal here. But you know what is a bigger deal? Is that not so great looking hand there? Having two swamps as your only mana base there is not what Javier really wants. And honestly, the Pelucranos in hand is not great either. You really want it on top of your deck being milled over immediately with the Thieves Guild Enforcer or something like that. I've watched uh, Dominguez play a lot of Magic. He is a very expressive player, and it looks like, based on the reaction he's got, it looks like his world's coming to an end. Oh, no, this hand has two swamps. What will what will I do? My, my career is over. He's just such an expressive and passionate player. If you watch him, uh, watch him play, he really puts his heart and soul into every match, and he's going to keep this. This is a sketchy old hand, but with some early interaction in the form of Heartless Act, I mean, Valky is a Goblin Piker. I guess you can play it out. He'll be hoping for some uh, some kindness from the top of his library here. Yeah, that is definitely a risky keep. But if we just see a blue source on top, you know, this hand is pretty much. Oh, how about three up blue sources Omen. getting milled? Yeah, there it is. <laughs> three blue sources got milled by that Ruin Crab, but uh, Dominguez Classic. luckily hits that Fable Passage. That can go and fetch an island. Although he'll take his time with it. Going to play the Swamp first, maybe. Fire up that Heartless Act. Yes, indeed. Here it is. And uh, as you say, with Polykay in hand, he's not going to mind too much that the Ruined Crab is giving him fodder for that. But uh, all the same here, he's... Oh, okay. No, thinks thinks better of casting the Heartless Act. Maybe going to fire that one off at instant speed instead. Yeah, exactly. Pelucranos eventually just going to be able to, uh, you know, do some serious work on this battlefield. Uh, even just playing it on four, that ability to just be able to fight down John Emmanuel Dupra's creatures is just so good because, I mean, think about fighting Rune Crab. Think about fighting all these one ones. Mm. It, you just get to keep doing it over and over and over again. It's a really tough card for Demir Rogues to deal with. Yeah, Pelucranos certainly, you know, as with so many of the escape cards, really does a lot of work. He's a Cultivate. Now, this probably means that we'll see Fable Passage for green instead of blue because next turn the Cultivate can go and get an I oh, yeah, go and get an island, even two islands for double blue, whatever. Uh, but this means that the mana is ma basically unlocked and Dominguez now in a much better position than you would think based on how we could have seen things go after that opening hand. <laughs> And I wanted to point something out with Javier's uh, cam there. Having his card right above him there is just saying, hey, I've made it to world once. I've done it before. I want to do it again here. I'm sure that right next to that on his wall, he wants to hang another picture with mm. his likeness. A second one. That's right. Perfect you know, we, spot we've, for it. Yeah. we used to call them invitational cards, cards that feature the likeness of, of players. Uh, mm -hmm. these days they're given out uh, as, a, as a rare honor to those who have won world championships. The first one was with Javier Dominguez, second one with Paolo Vida Damito Rosa. And uh, look, if Javier wins another world title, I mean, he'll be, the, he'll be the first and only person ever to be featured on two Magic cards. And, you know, yeah. we, we've talked about a lot of big names in Magic. No one's made that achievement so far. Yeah, do you think he would want to have his two cards have synergy together? Would that be the first move? Be like, all right, I need a I great probably, card right? that gets pumped by Fervent Champion or something like that. I mean, I think that's what I would want to go for. I mean, I'm very, I'm always happy to see more knights getting printed, so I'd be for that as well. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's do it. Maybe a it. knight that says, when it, a knight with heroic, whenever this becomes the target of an ability, X happens. There you go. Look at that. You're the only heroic knight we need, Riley. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> Soon, Javier Dominguez will have won enough world championships that he can build an entire EDH deck out of decks that, uh, out of cards that just have his face on them. That's 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 that's, the, that's the what Dominguez is uh, is trying to do here. Valky God of Lies has nicked that Lurus, but it's only a temporary situation here as the Lurus is returned after Heartless Act takes out the Valky. We don't often see Valky cast as a two-one. Often it's why uh, you wait until you can cast it as as Tibbers or cheated into play. With something like yep. an emergent ultimatum. But this crab doing work now. Temple of Ruin. Getting rid of yeah, three really? more cards. As a Yorion deck, you're not too worried about being milled out, although it can happen. 
I was just going to say, we the one thing that John Emmanuel Dupra was really missing from his draw is just a card that would draw him four magic cards. And we see into the story on top there that's going to be huge. And yeah, he even contemplated a little bit. I don't think that was even a remote question, but didn't want to just give it away that, all right, I have into the story on top. Has a nice play with Luris, being able to put that win robber down. And now it's just going to be draw a bunch of cards next turn. And that is not what Javier wants to be drawing, is all these emergent ultimatum targets instead of, well, emergent ultimatum. So, we're going to see an omen of the sea. I think the Spaniard here will be looking for some extra lands and finds, Ooh. well, finds a Zagoth Triome, also finds Emergent Ultimatum. No, he's an untapped else land. Here. Yeah, he needs an untapped land for Extinction Event here on Odd. That's really what he was going for. A little bit of a greedy play, but Javier, with uh, the amount of mana problems that he's been having already, I think that was the right time that you have to try to make a play that's a little bit more risky to get yourself back into it, but the risk really did not pay off, and now into the story is going to push him, John Emmanuel Dupra, even farther ahead. We know that into the story, a, a, a really, really important piece of the Rogues deck, one of the key cards, and you can see why refilling your hand here for just four mana. Four mana draw four is bananas. Like, let's not make any bones about that fact. A four mana draw four is absolutely ridiculous. Yeah, it, it now, really is incredible. We'll see what Dupar wants to do. Trigger the Ruin Crab once again. Leaving up two mana here with Double Soaring Thought Thief. That's not too bad. He's going to be able to use his mana. And representing, you know, a Counterspell or something like that. Yeah, we'll Both see if players. he wants to sack the Wind Robber to bring it back and get that extra card advantage or just represent another threat. Decides the end step threat is a little bit more valuable. No more basics now for Dominguez. A lot of them have been milled over. Here's a binding the old gods. Okay. So rather than the extinction event here, instead of choosing to play out the saga, is this because he thinks that he's okay with this one being counted? Yeah, probably the tester. Uh, just getting Luris out of there. No matter what, he had to play something mm -hmm. that dealt with Luris because, you know, Luris just hanging on the battlefield, letting M Merfolk Wind Robber come back over and over and draw a card is just not what he can be doing right now. And with the Extinction event, all it does is clean up one extra Rune Crab. Not the biggest deal right now because this is a Yorian deck, so you're playing 80 cards. So milling out the Yorian deck, while not impossible, is a lot more difficult. So a decent enough hand for Dupra. It's got threats and uh, that Agadim's Awakening, which can bring back Lurus. That's typically what the card is used for. Mm -hmm. uh, but not a lot of in the way of interaction. And, you know, with that bind in the old gods, maybe Dominguez is starting to put together the pieces of the puzzle here, realize that uh, Jean-Emmanuel Dupra doesn't have a lot going on in hand, potentially. Difficult to tell with the rogues play. It just always feels like they've just always got it, but yeah, it seems uh, it it seems like you know a glitch in the in the system or something to not have a drawn in the lock by this stage of the game. It's uh, pretty pretty mind blowing. Yeah, I do got to say I love Javier's mana base. He has the correct basic lands, the most oh, the, beautiful the basic old, lands. The old in the John game. Avon ones, big fan Ooh, of them. Oh, I love them. I have those hung up on my wall in multiple places of my house. So uh, oh. props to you, Javier. Over the Eye Tyrant is going to get in as well. Exile a card from the graveyard. In and the crab to getting those in there rogues. Too. Yeah, we've seen the crab get busy a couple of times here. Dipka, obviously, yeah. just on the full aggression plan here. In they come. Dominguez takes nine down to six. The folk when Robert Mills another card. And you can see he's sitting back. He's not happy with his position. Here's the Gargaroth. Yeah, not One looking of the old great. gods fetches a triome. So we have eight mana available. Um, so the biggest threats are these Soaring Thought Thieves, so we're probably going to see this on even. Mm -hmm. yeah, that will um, remove a lot of power from the battlefield. Yeah, it will. It will leave a Merfolk Wind Robber and then the Hives, so that is four um, damage that can come through unblocked. And then you can just play that Pelucranos and really hope it lives. As we are going to see, it does look like it's going to live, but we can even just have Soaring Thought Thief come back with Agadim's Awakening. So it looks like Javier can survive the turn, and we'll just see if he can push far ahead uh, on the next turn to to keep himself alive. If this Pelucranos sticks around for any appreciable amount of time, it is going to do some work. Let's see what the draw is here for Dupra, and if it gives him an option 
to kill the Hydra. Something like a Heartless Act isn't going to do it. You'd need the power word kill or something similar. Yeah, or a drown in the locker into the story. That's definitely the best draws uh, for John Emanuel. But no, just another rune crab. But that is a ton of cards right there. Yeah, I don't know how much it's of a worry 12. that is for Dominguez, though. We, we, it'd be nice to know how many cards he's got in the, in the library. I believe there's kind of a visual cue where you see yeah. a, a large more stack uh, in the graveyard at around 30, I want to say. But uh, yep. Okay, oh, there so we go. 22. 22. When it gets below 30, I believe it, it looks like that. And there's that oh, power, and the power kill, which was kill, huge. dude. Oh, man. And that's going to make it so much harder. It. It's going to make it so much harder for Dominguez, particularly as the Hive of the Eye Tyrant can eat the Pelucranos out of the bin so it can't come back again. I really yeah. think that, that Dominguez's path to stabilization, it, it began and now ended with that Pelucranos. I mean, he's got the Gargaroth, he's got a Kirobes the Sea God, but he has to start digging for something else because, I mean, he's dead to the Hive. Yeah, it was interesting, though. He did have, if I was counting correctly, 10 mana to be able to go Gargaroth plus Yorian, and I do think that would have kept him alive. But as it stands, just this cure of best of sea gods will not do it because of the menace of hive. Yeah. So I'm yeah. interested to see. Um, maybe I miscounted on that one. No, it does look like we have ten. But that, of course, is very um, vulnerable to well, just room crab milling out at this point too. You're getting close to get milled out there. Um, yeah. Not not too much you can do. Really, really rough bounce for Dominguez here. He kept a speculative hand. And while it worked out okay-ish, uh, obviously Dipkai just had a much, much more robust game and uh, really tough for Dominguez to get a foothold in this matchup at the best of times and uh, obviously couldn't happen here as the Frenchman takes it out in very convincing circumstances. We're going to have a look at how they've sideboarded here. Out comes Ruin Crab and we're shaving Heartless Act and Disdainful Stroke for two copies that cling to dust. Makes a lot of sense. And some extra yep. threats in the form of Skyclave Shade. I like to see them, although they are pretty bad against Extinction Event. On the other side of things, look at that. Quite some uh, significant changes being made to Dominguez uh, and his <laughs> Soltai list. Two copies of Emergent Ultimatum come out. The Sorcery Speed Clunky Binding uh, comes out in addition to some Wolf Willow Havens and the Voren Clex. Bunch of extra interaction and, of course, Coma coming in from the sideboard here. So, I mean, Dominguez is going to do what he can to make the deck better. His deck certainly improves a bit more than De Praz's one does in this matchup. But I think De Praz still in a in a very comfortable position in this matchup. Yeah, I you said it. You said it right. Javier's deck improves, but the way these Soltai Ultimatum decks have been designed in the past, mm. they've improved a lot more. Like there's been an extra Pelucranos. There's been like maybe two Cling to Dusts in the sideboard of these Soltai decks. There's been a lot more hate mm. for Rogues. At previous times, you can tell the focus is not necessarily on rogues with this style of Soltai Ultimatum. So normally this matchup flips from like a 65, you know, 35 in favor of rogues for game one to around 50-50 to slightly favored even for Soltai when you are prepared for it. Javier's sideboard is good. Duresses are great and stuff like that, but it, it really isn't the high level of escape cards that you want that kind of push it back to in your favor. So this is going to be a really tough match here for the former world champion to lock up his top eight berth uh, during this match. Are we going to see a Skyclave Shade get four spiked? Yes, we are. Juari Disruption taking care of this 3-1. So Dominguez putting some roadblocks in the way of the most aggressive potential of the Rogue deck here and getting a bit of extra value out of a card that, it, you know, Juari Disruption falls off pretty sharply. Corey, I want to come back to those comments you were making about Sultai Ultimate and the way that it's changed. I mean, obviously, when mm. this deck first broke out, it looked very different. Uh, it was a lot more glass cannony. It played fewer in uh, interactive pieces and, you know, four copies of Alrun's Epiphany and three copies of Tybalt. And it was mm. much, it went much harder in the paint, I think it's fair to say. Yeah. Now it well does said. play a more interactive game. It does play, you know, it's got four or even, sorry, it's got eight copies of, you know, two mana black removal spells with Power Word Kill now. And yep. it's much more of a traditional control deck. It's changed, right? It's not the it's not the same yeah. deck that it was. Even if it's the same kind of broad stroke strategy, this this list has shifted its positioning significantly. Yeah. And and that really is a product of Winota. It's so crazy that we look at the metagame breakdown from both the MPL and Rivals Gauntlet, and Winota was not really represented. But it was so popular um a while ago in the Challenger Gauntlet and just really 
on the ladder, everything, you know, it was being played a lot. So all of these decks went to prepare for that and two mana removal with power word kill and heartless act is the best way to deal with those decks. So we, we even see, you know, a lot of power word kills in the rogues list as well. It's crazy to me how much of an imprint uh, Naya Winota has on the metagame, even though it's not the biggest deck and not even close to the biggest deck. It's just something you have to respect because it's so powerful. Another land here for Dominguez. He's working towards that powerful seven mana sorcery, Emergent Ultimatum, the card for which the deck is named. But Deprise putting together a respectable enough attack force here. We're going to see an upkeep power word kill. Obviously casting the upkeep here to tie up Deprise mana should he choose to respond. Although I don't know what responses he really has here. Drown in the Lock was an option, but I'm sure you can find something more, uh, a more succulent target for that one. He's just drawn a second one. <laughs> Making up for the ones he didn't draw in game number one. There in for go, four yeah. damage now. Yeah, I never really mind when I'm playing rogues. Just losing that first creature, it's just like, okay, now Luris just has some food later. Yeah. So no matter what, my mana is going to uh, you know, be able to do something throughout the game. Luris, bring back one Thieves Guild Enforcer, is such a powerful play that you just let that first one go. And you're like, yeah, that's okay. Dominguez can flash in this Omen of the Sea as well, but he'll have a hard time, I think, resolving his these big heavy hitters. You know, I mean, technically he can cast Ulrun's Epiphany next turn, but with the hand that Depra has, it's going to be a very, very risky proposition to try to force through these big haymakers here. Yeah, and we just did a glance there. I was going to say, if there is only six cards in Graveyard, we're almost going to see Javier jam this Ulrun's Epiphany no matter what, because it at least plays around Drown in the Loch. But we do see Disdainful Stroke, which would, could deal with it anyways. And, well, there's seven cards, so it doesn't truly matter. But that's something to always keep in mind mm. when looking at the dynamics of what to play. You just really think, okay, is, is, <laughs> is there five cards in my graveyard? I should try to play a six drop. So there are six cards, I should try to play a seven drop and try to just get over these Drawn of the Locks when, when you can. It's funny because, like, I think a lot of people, I'm certainly one of them, when playing against rogues, like, you just assume that Drown the Lock is always live, you know? Yeah. You, yeah. you cast you, you cast an Ulamog, and you're like, oh, it's probably getting counts. Like, wait, I've got one card in my graveyard. Like, what am I, <laughs> what am, what am I worried about, you know? <laughs> oh. Yeah, it does seem like it's always live. It's just such a good card. There goes the other All Runs Epiphany. That's something to keep in mind that we just see get milled over mm -hmm. because I think it's in the while. Copies. Exactly, exactly. While these um, Emergent Ultimatum decks are Yorian decks where you're going to have a lot of targets for Emergent Ultimatums, they can just get milled over and then all of a sudden you Emergent Ultimatum and you look and you're like, oh no, I can get Elder Gargaroth, Extinction Event, and Omen of the Sea or something because your Kiora Best of Sea Gods, your Velkies, your All Runs Epiphanies has been milled over and uh, that's a that's a real cost at times. So a great looking hand here for Dupin. Got all the pieces he needs. Got removal spells, counter spells. Got Luris to recur things as well. Looking very good. Yeah, and right now, John Emmanuel Dupra is just really contemplating, do I have the luxury to play Luris, bring back um, one of our one mana rogues, and then only have one counter spell available? It's slightly risky, because just think if Javier goes land seven, all runs Epiphany plus Dispute backup, the game could just end. You know, yeah. right? You get to untap and then emerge an ultimatum. As it stands now, uh, John Emanuel would have much rather played a Luris and played a one drop and then drowned as well. Hindsight's 2020 on this, of course, and this was the much safer play. Um, but now with only one disruptive counter spell from John Emanuel Dupra, we're probably going to see it now, the Luris being played. Maybe even drawn a card with Wind Robber. Play that instead uh, just to make sure you can get another permission spell. Yeah, that's right. And I mean, in this position here, you know, Jean Emmanuel would surprise that far ahead mm -hmm. that he doesn't need to take any extra risks. You know, there's no there's no point in attempting to close the game out one turn earlier when you're odds on going to close it out in two turns. And it comes back to one of the fundamental principles of magic, which is when you're behind, you need to take risks. And when you're yeah. ahead, you need to not take risks. The further behind you are, the bigger the risk you have to take. And the further behind, the further ahead you are, the fewer risks you should be taking. You should just shore up the position that you currently have. So smart stuff there from Dupra. We're going to see an emergent ultimatum almost forced through. Dominguez is representing a mystical dispute. 
But it's not going to be enough here with the Merchant Ultimatum countered by Drown the Loch. Damn. And that is going to be enough for De Prat to take out this game and indeed this match. Domingo's going down two games to zero. He's going to have to have another try at snagging himself a slot in that top.